Hello and welcome to story time at 9. As many of you know, many of you seem to be regular viewers. Well, you know that every Saturday right at 9 p.m. we are live on the Buckle Foundation channels on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. And we travel to different countries with the finest storytellers from that country who's been, who've been introducing us to their country and culture. So the basic idea as we have talked about is multicultural exposure. And for a long time, you know, we have been having storytellers from Europe, from North America, from South America, from um, Asia as well. But I was very keen to have a storyteller from the Middle East and we didn't have anyone. And then I got a four in one, like a quadruple bonanza. <laughs> so a friend, uh, a storyteller who's going to come next Saturday, I won't tell who that is, which country that is, that you have to guess. I'll give you a clue. Now, he connected us with Teresa, and uh, Teresa is one of the finest storytellers from Lebanon, but then she's not only from Lebanon. I mean, of course, she's Lebanese, but then she has a background in the United States. Uh, I mean, she is multicultural, as multicultural as they get. So today, in one session, we'll get to know about Lebanon, of course, uh, the beautiful, very rich country of Lebanon. You know, and Lebanon is also special for me because I studied literature and I'm very fond of a poet, Khalil Gibran. So those of you, the children may not know, but many of your parents would know the poet Khalil Gibran. Now he is from Lebanon and he was also diasporic, you know, from Lebanon, but settled in the US, settled outside the way uh, Theresa has been, you know. So uh, so there's the United States, there's France, where she is currently, and there's Germany, where she also studied. So four cultures in one person and in one session you're going to have today. So we have a very exciting session ahead. You know, thanks to Theresa. I'm sure you're looking forward to it. Uh, so welcome, Theresa, to this show. Very happy to Thank have you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so, you, Sujit. I'm so happy to be here. Wonderful. What an introduction. Thank you so much. So welcome. exciting to be here so with you. Waiting for this. But before we start uh, listening to Teresa's stories, I want to tell you that today we have Teresa. I mean, it's a special session, the way, as I said it, from our perspective. It's also a special day today. And we are very happy to have her with us because today happens to be 5th December. Every year is celebrated as the International Volunteer Day. Now, children, I don't know whether you understand the word volunteer. So volunteer means someone who is working for the greater good of people without any payment. Okay. That's, I mean, there are many ways in understanding. So there are people who say volunteers are not paid, not because uh, they are cheap but because they are priceless. And you know, Buckle Foundation, our organization is run through volunteers. So I'm a volunteer, but you get to see me every Saturday. There are so many volunteers who work behind the scenes that you don't get to see. For example, you know, we are on the show, but there are people at the back end behind, you know, who are ensuring when do I come full screen? When does the storyteller come full screen? How does the presentation happen? All of that. There is publicity. There are posters to be made. Someone makes the posters. You must have seen that on Facebook and YouTube. There are moderators who respond to your queries, who tell you, don't talk now. Listen to the stories. You can ask your questions. So those are also volunteers. So, they, so all of them, you know, so for us, you know, we would like to take this opportunity today to thank the many volunteers who have been working behind the scenes. I'll just introduce you to some of them, not all of them, but many people have been working behind the scenes. I would like to thank them. And I would request you to also show your gratitude to all these volunteers by commenting in the comments box, by thanking them, you know, particularly if you recognize them or otherwise, I would really love it if you can thank all the volunteers who've been working to ensure that you have a wonderful experience. Starting with our storytellers. So each of the storyteller has been volunteering, you know, uh, they have been affected by COVID like all of us. 
but they are not charging anything. So they have been, otherwise we would not have been able to have such fantastic storytellers like Teresa. So first I would like to thank you, Teresa, and all the other storytellers, professional storytellers like you who have volunteered to make this show so wonderful. And can we see the others? And I will introduce each of them. Hi, I'm Prayash Mahapatra. I write software and make copy on the site. <laughs> okay, so Prayash is the guy, you know, he is our technical expert. So whenever we have problems, you know, when we wanted to go online, how do we do it? How do we go live and on multiple platforms? Whenever there's a problem, major problem, he stays in Bangalore. He is an IT engineer and he is always there for our solutions. You know, whatever technical problems we have, he gives the solution. So can we have the next volunteer here? Hi, I'm a computer. I have done mechanical engineering and now I'm preparing for my entrance examination. So that is Safiola. Uh, he has been there every session. He is there at the back end, ensuring, you know, he is the one who is now playing the video when the video is, I mean, the speaker is supposed to come. He could not make himself more audible, but he's the one who decides, you know, who's been doing all these changes. He also designs the posters that you get to see, you know. So when uh, we had to have Teresa's photo with the cedar tree, so Teresa told us that is how I think I would like Lebanon to be introduced. Now Safi is the person who made those posters, right? So he has a major role in all our online storytelling sessions. The next. Hi everyone, a very good evening to you all. I am Sudiksha Sahu. I work in Bakul Foundation and I hope you all have been enjoying our storytelling sessions. Thank you so much. Bye. So Sudiksha is the one who coordinates with all the volunteers. As I told you, there are, there are some volunteers who are doing this. There are some volunteers who are sending you mails, okay, emails, there are WhatsApp messages. There are people who are moderating. So all the different people who are working behind the scenes, Sudiksha coordinates all of them. The next one. Hello everyone, this is Jayasundar Kaur. Currently, I'm preparing for UGC NET and PhD entrances and also pursuing my Visharad in Hindustani classical music. Thank you. So Jayasmita is one of the moderators, you know, that you might have seen introducing herself. Hello, I'm Jayasmita, I moderate. I'm the moderator today and I will be taking questions and all of that. So the others also, so they're all students like Safi, before that, you know, who is preparing for his MBA. Uh, Jasmita is has done her master's in English. So can we have the others, all the others together? Hi, I am Arpita Biswal. I am from Bhubaneswar. Currently, I am preparing for my entrance exams. Thank you. I am Shruti Kanungo. I study in Devonshire University. I am a plus three first year student of sociology honors. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Yeah. So uh, there was uh, Shruti, there was Arpita, Jasmita. All of them have been, uh, you know, moderating the either the Facebook or the YouTube channel. And now we'll have Shatabdi. Can we have Shatabdi? Okay, that's fine. So thank you to all the volunteers, you know, those of you who came online now and all others who did not come online. There are many others who did not want to come on screen and say that, hello, I have been doing this, you know, which is fine. Appreciate that. But thank you to everyone. And I hope all of you will show your gratitude to all these volunteers who've been working behind the scenes. And now to the number one volunteer today, Teresa Amun and her stories. But before that, as I've told you earlier, if you like the video, if you like these storytelling sessions, please share the video.
please subscribe to our youtube channel and like the facebook page please do that and a little teaser before the storytelling starts the next country that we'll travel to is the country of the snow white and the seven dwarfs the country where this story comes from snow white and the seven dwarfs i'm sure all of you know this okay now if you guess the country you write it down in the comments box at the end of the session today i will declare the answer at the very end i will tell you which country we'll travel to next saturday but then before that we'll have the questions before the question and answer session with Teresa will have her presentation on Lebanon and the other countries that she will be talking about. But and right now, the stories. Over to you. Sorry. No, wonderful, wonderful. It's wonderful to see a whole team behind you, Sujit. It's beautiful to see all these people who have volunteered and, and given their time uh, to make this happen. So thank you to all. And today, well, I'm very happy to be with you and to uh, be able to share stories from Paris, France, which is where I, I live and where I've lived for many years. Um, behind me, you can see through the window, let's see, it's this side, yes, but the, the rooftops of Paris. So, um, you know, it's a beautiful city to live in. But first of all, um, I'm going to tell you a story that comes from my ancestors' country, which is the country of Lebanon. I'll talk about Lebanon later in the presentation, but let's start with the story. This is my drum. You won't see it all while I'm playing, but you will hear it. Tanjara Imme Tanjara Tanjara Mother Tanjara Tanjara Imme Tanjara Tanjara Mother There was once a woman She was very poor And all alone She had no child to help her and that made her very sad, oh yes. And one day she was so frustrated that she burst out and said, if only God would give me a daughter, even if it's a cooking pot. Well, that very day she fell pregnant, yes. And nine months later, she gave birth. Uh, well, the delivery was a little difficult because from her womb came a cooking pot. Yes. Well, the woman didn't know what to think, but it was her daughter after all. So she scrubbed the pot until it was clean, rubbed it until it shined, and put it on a shelf. Well, a few weeks later she hears, Mother! The woman looks around to see who's speaking and realizes it's the pot. Mother! Take me down and put me on the threshold. Why, my daughter? Put me on the threshold, and I will make you rich, you and your future descendants. Well, the woman obeys. She takes the pot down, puts her on the threshold, and immediately the pot takes off, all the while rolling, all the while saying, Tanjara, Tanjara, Imme, Tanjara, Tanjara, Mother. Tanjara, Tanjara, Imme, Tanjara, Tanjara, Mother. A pot gets to the marketplace where there are people everywhere. They come and go, but nobody stops until one man sees the pot and says, Oh, that's a very nice cooking pot. Whose is it? 
The man asks to the right. The man asks to the left. Nobody says it's mine. Well, so he picks up the pot, puts it under his arm, and takes it to the honey merchant. He asks the honey merchant to fill up the pot with sticky, yellow, sweet honey. And he puts on the lid and goes home. Well, when he gets there, he tells his wife what's inside. Oh, she's very happy about it, and she becomes very sweet. You know, that happens when people give you honey, they become sweet, you know. And she takes the pot and puts it on a shelf. Well, a few days later, she's having a dinner party, and she wants to give some of the honey to her guests. So she takes down the pot, pulls on the lid, but the honey is still hid. Uh, her husband tries next. He is thoroughly vexed. The guests give it a shot. But they can't open the pot. Uh, they take the pot to the blacksmith who pulls, pounds, hammers, but cannot cope with what to do. A curse upon your owner's parents, says the man who found the pot at the beginning. What, what do we need something like you for? And he opens up the door and throws the pot out. Well, immediately the pot takes off. All the while rolling, all the while saying. Dungeon, dungeon in me. My mouth is all filled with honey, Tanjara, Tanjara, mother. you like it. It's really yummy. And the pot rolls all the way home. Well, when the mother sees it, she says, Yay, 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 yay. Oh, I have to explain this to you. That's what my mother said. Every time that I did something naughty, she would say that. Yay, 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 yay. Unfortunate creature. But then the pot lets its lid slide right off, and the mother sees what's inside. She becomes sweet as well. <laughs> she empties the pot and then scrubs it until it shines and puts it on a shelf. Well, a few days later she hears, Mother, put me on the threshold. But my daughter, no, put me on the threshold and I will make you rich, you and your future descendants. Well, once again, the pot takes off, all the while rolling, all the while saying, Tanjara, Tanjara, Imre, Tanjara, Tanjara, Mother, Tanjara, Tanjara, Imre, Tanjara, Tanjara, my mom. And the pot comes to a crossroads, and people are going and coming and going and coming and going and coming, and one man stops. He sees the pot and says, Hmm, what's a pot doing here? Hmm, quite nice. Whose is it? The man asks to the right. The man asks to the left. Nobody says it's... Well, he picks up the pot and goes right to the butchers. He fills the pot up with some nice red meat and puts the lid on, goes home, and tells his wife what's, in his, what's inside. Well, she's delighted, especially when her husband asks her to make a very nice stew the next day. She takes the pot and, well, since there weren't refrigerators at the time, she goes into a back room and puts it on. Yes. When it comes time to make the stew, well, the lid doesn't open. The woman attempts, but there are no events. Uh, the man tries after. It's a disaster. The children try too. They call out boo. The pot is taken to the blacksmith who pulls, pounds, hammers, and cannot cope with. What to do? A curse upon your owner's parents, 
says the man who found the pot. What should we do with a thing like you, huh? And as he'd gone home, he, he went upstairs and opened the window and threw the pot out. Hey! But immediately the pot takes off. All the while rolling, all the while saying. Tanjira, tanjira, imme. My mouth is filled with good red meat. Tanjira, tanjira, mother. Come on, dig in, and we'll all eat. Yee, ye, 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 unfortunate creature. Oh. And that evening, the mother has a nice meal. Then, after she's eaten, she empties the pot. She she scrubs it until it's clean, cleaned, and she she rubs it until it shines. And then she puts it on. Mm -hmm. Well, the very next day, she hears, Mother! <laughs> this time, the pot rolls right behind the king's palace and gets to a square. Well, the king's son, the prince, is walking right by. He sees the pot and says, oh, well, what a nice cooking utensil. It shines like silver. Whose is it? And the prince asks to the, the prince asks to the, nobody says it's. So he picks up the pot and he takes it into the palace and he gives it to his wife, the princess. Oh, she is delighted. She loves that pot so much. She puts all her jewels inside. Gold, silver, rubies, emeralds, diamonds. Oh, and closes the lid tightly and puts it on. So, two days later, it's her brother's wedding. So the princess puts on her very finest gown and wants to put on her jewels. She takes down the pot, pulls on the top, but it's a flop. The prince tries as well. It's not too swell. The king, the queen, even the jester try the routine. The blacksmith can simply not cope with a curse upon your owner's family, says the prince. What do we need a pot like this for? And he goes right to the top of the highest tower of the palace and throws the pot over the walls. And ooh. Ay! And immediately the pot takes off, all the while rolling, all the while saying. Is filled with jewels and gold. Tanjira, Tanjira, mother. Retirement for when you're old. Unfortunate creature. Oh. And that's when the mother sees what's inside. Well, she's happy, but she turns to her daughter and says, Now, no more, huh? Everybody knows you. Oh, Mom. And a few hours later, Mother! Well, this time, the pot is rolling when she crosses paths with the man who saw her the first time. And the man says, oh, that pot is here again. Hmm. Well, it's probably enchanted and is mocking us. A curse upon your owner's family. I'm going to do caca inside. Yes, the man relieves his bowels inside the pot. Hmm. 
And that's where the expression sitting on the pot comes from. But he doesn't see the lid which comes behind him and hits him on the bottom and I the man runs in one direction, his pants around his ankles, and, and the pot rolls in the other, all the while saying, Tanjara, Tanjara, Imme, my mouth is all filled with caca, Tanjara, Tanjara, Mom, I think I'm going to gag, 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 unfortunate creature. And the mother empties the pot, scrubs it, and puts perfume inside, scrubs it some more, shines it, and puts it on. Well, did the pot leave home again? Or be nice. Before going out, it now thinks twice. And that's my story from Lebanon. Now, how are you doing over there, okay? Yes. Well, I'd like to tell you also some other stories. Now, I've traveled a lot. I have to have something to drink first. Hmm. I traveled a lot. And, um, of course, I've been to different countries. And I also enjoy working with people who have come from other countries. So, as I told you, I live in Paris, and I was gathering stories from people who had come from many different countries. They live in the north part of Paris, in the suburbs. Now, you must know that in Paris's suburbs, there are areas which are very multicultural. People have come from many, many different countries, and they live together in some kind of harmony. Sometimes it's difficult, but sometimes it's absolutely wonderful. And I was gathering stories, and there was a group of, of women. Now, I'm going to let you guess where this woman came from. She was wearing bracelets, a lot of bracelets, up until her elbows, both sides. Very nice. And she had a very long cloth around her body that was wrapped around and then over the shoulder. And she had a red dot right there called a bindi. You guessed it. She was from India. And she had come to France and settled, was settling in France and learning French. So she had told me a story that her grandfather had told her. And she told it first in French and which was a language, as I said, she was learning. And then she went to English because she spoke very good English and then French and English and French and English. So I'd like to tell you this story in the same way. Now, don't worry. Even if you don't understand the French, you will understand the story. Just listen. There was once a very poor farmer. Ce paysan était si pauvre qu'il ne pouvait pas nourrir ses enfants. His children were very, very hungry. So the farmer decided to plant onions. Les oignons étaient difficiles de trou uh, trouver à l'époque, alors les planter, ça allait lui rapporter de l'argent. So the farmer planted onions and he waited. Il a attendu très longtemps. When the onions were almost ready, he was so happy. I'm going to sell them and make a lot of money. 
la veille de la récolte, il y a eu une, une inondation and the onions were covered by the floodwaters. So the farmer sat on the ground and, and he cried, il a pleuré, and he cried, il a pleuré, and he cried. In his sadness, he let out a curse. Et voici sa malédiction. Celui qui prend un oignon et le coupe pleurera pour moi et ma famille. He who takes an onion and cuts it will cry for me and my family. And this is why on pleure when we cut these oignons. So, now that you've heard a little French, and you've heard also about onions, which is really the basis of all good cooking, huh? I can continue in this vein of uh, food. <laughs> and I can tell you that in that same area, I received a lot of recipes. You know, how to make food, the recipes telling you how much you put this and that in, in a dish. And these recipes came from people from all over the world. It was kind of a gift to me and also a link to their home country. But I didn't know what to do with these recipes, you know. I wasn't going to tell them one after the other. So I decided to put them together sort of mix them together, put them in the oven. <laughs> I waited a while, and out of the oven came the recipe wrap. Now, you can participate at home. When I ask you, you can repeat what I've said. Just listen. Tomatoes. Peppers and lots of peanut butter makes African muffin, which tastes like no other. Tastes like no other. Chunks of meat and fresh vegetables, spices and white rice put together makes a biryani all very nice. All very. Anishtayoto, chopped onions and cracked wheat, black pepper, green parsley, and freshly ground meat. This dish fills right up hungry stomachs in Turkey, while in India are dunked in sauce. Fluffy yidli, fluffy yid. A tagine, well made by expert Moroccan hands, must simmer for an hour. It doesn't come from cans. It doesn't come. To top off our international five-course meal, a fine West Indies cake will sweetly close the deal with pineapple, coconut, and vanilla bits. Its soft center will send the eater into fits. Into. If you think fine dining belongs to just one place, come to Paris's suburbs and give the world a taste. Et voilà! That is the recipe wrap from Paris's suburbs. Okay, well, Sujit, I can go on to the presentation now, if you like. Um, yeah, we can do that. But I love the recipe think? wrap. I think, I think, Teresa, I would request yeah. you to record the recipe wrap and share it separately. You know, we'll share it independently. So oh, wonderful. Can, Learning, you know, and this was a real surprise. I never knew I'm going to hear about biryani. And it will be. <laughs> we have some good biryani here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I hope all of you know, you know, I'm sure there must be many questions that you have after Teresa, uh, you know, talks about, does the presentation, then we'll have the questions from you. So, you, you know, if you put it in the comments box, we will get to, uh, we will ask Teresa those questions and she will answer. Uh, do we have Saswati now, sorry, Satabdi, who has been moderating on YouTube? Uh, she could not come that time, but she is not online right now as well. So, Teresa, why don't you start the presentation right now? And once again, requesting all of you, please share, subscribe, and like the channel. and share the video if you like it right but let's get to know about uh, the countries that she has traveled to 
Great. All right. Can you see my screen? Just let me know. Yes. Shout out. Sajid, can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Please All recommend. right. All right, good. Okay. All right. So here's a map. And here you can see the little country we call Lebanon. It's not very big, you see, wedged in there between Syria and Israel and Turkey above it. But it is a very powerful country. Why is it powerful? Because it sends a lot of its um, citizens out of the country. Well, I don't mean it sends it, but a lot of Lebanese actually settle in the rest of the world, you see. There are many more Lebanese, and I think it's the only country in the world, there are many more Lebanese outside the country than inside. I think the numbers are about 5 to 6 million inside and 15 to 16 million outside. And with a little anecdote about that is that, um, I mean, I've traveled a lot and I was in the middle of, of Mexico um, in a village where there wasn't much around the village nor in the village. And uh, I went into the only shop in the village and uh, started looking at things. And the man turned to me and said, are you Lebanese? I said, yes. And he said, so am I. <laughs> so, you know, it's amazing in the middle of nowhere, you can find even Lebanese in the village of uh, Mexico. And a lot of, a lot of Lebanese went to South America, uh, Mexico is North America, but went to Brazil and, and other countries and also in Europe. So, this is where Lebanon is. Now, let's look at my own travels. Here we are. Little Lebanon, you see this arrow here? And going then up to Germany. Well, why Germany? Guess what? That's where I was born. I know it's strange, but <laughs> I happen to be born in Germany. Now, I have nothing that's German. My parents are Lebanese. My father was born in the United States, Lebanese parents who had immigrated to the United States. Um, but I was born in Germany. Fate is strange, huh? All right. So then you go see the, the arrow going to Los Angeles, California, the other side of the United States. You see it there on the left. And that's where I lived after living in Europe for quite some time. See, I, I was living in Germany and France and the Netherlands and other countries and kept going back to Lebanon when I was a child. But then when I was a teenager, I was in the United States, in Los Angeles, near Los Angeles anyway. And that's where I did my studies, university studies. And then I decided to move to France. Now, France, why France? Well, many reasons. But also because the relationship between France and Lebanon is very close. Lebanon was under French rule for many years after the well, this is a bit of history, it may be complicated, but anyway, let me tell you. The Ottoman Empire, which was Turkey, was had um, Lebanon was part of the Ottoman Empire, and then it was under French mandate, and then it became independent in 1946. So France had a lot to do with determining things in Lebanon. Here's the Lebanese flag on the left. You can see it has a tree on it. And the tree on the right is a cedar tree. This is a very important tree that grows in the mountains of Lebanon. And these cedars can be hundreds and thousand year old trees. And they're very big and very majestic. And there are only two cedar forests left in Lebanon. One of them is very close to the a uh, town where my mother's family comes from. So the cedar is very important to me and to the country. This is a picture of Beirut, the capital of Lebanon. Now you can see that Beirut juts out into the sea, the sea around it's the Mediterranean Sea. And it's a, uh, whoa, it's got high buildings. Teresa? And it's got, Sorry. yes. 
the images are not moving. The images are not moving. You'll have to oh. scroll. The images. We are still stuck at the first slide. Oh no! Too bad. How? What do I need to do then? I need to yeah, click on. Did you? Now it's now? Moving. Ah, okay. So, now, but it's not now, full now screen for you. Flag, now the flag and the sanitary are there. Okay, so sorry. So this is the flag and the and the tree. Okay, that I was ta talking to you about. Now can you see Beirut? There it is. Yes. Okay, you can see the Mediterranean Sea all the way around, and um, this rock here. Can you see my little uh, arrow going around this rock? This is what yes. we call pigeon rock. All right, Raushi. Now, Raushi in Arabic is kind of a take on the French word roche, which means rock. And here on the right, you see a close up picture of Raushi. Now, it's sort of a symbol in Beirut, and people do evening walks very close to this uh, rock, but it's also said that it was part of a myth. Um, a Greek myth where, uh, well, it's a kind of a long story, but Medusa, who has snakes in her hair, was able to turn uh, things into stone. And when uh, a hero uh, was able to kill a sea monster, Medusa turned that sea monster into stone, and that's the sea monster there. So when you look at it, you can also see a sea monster. On the left is some of Beirut's architecture left over from the Ottoman Empire. You see these arches are very, mm, it's a very sort of a leftover of the architecture, but unfortunately there was a very big blast in uh, Beirut August of this year, and unfortunately a lot of these buildings probably got hurt because of the blast. Nonetheless, the ones that stand are still very beautiful. Food. Oh my goodness, it's so important in Lebanon, making food. And on the left, you can see something maybe you know, a dish from Lebanon, hummus, chickpea dip. You know hummus, I'm sure you do. It's got tahini, which is sesame paste, and chickpeas, and it's very, very good. So if you haven't tasted it, ask someone to make you hummus. And on the right, there's um, the uh, brochette, as they say, you know, skewers, shish kebab. Uh, this is a lamb shish kebab. And this here is a little bit of, I think, tabbouleh put, it, put on, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, I, I'm thinking in Arabic, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's some kind, it's a flatbread. All right, it's a flatbread. But the Lebanese love to eat. Oh, my goodness. So when you go and you have a meal and you're invited to, do, to a meal, guess what? You're going to eat a lot. <laughs> Look at all the dishes. Now, it's not always as full, the table, but still. And a lot of these dishes are vegetarian dishes. So there's a lot of different things you can taste when you go and have dinner with someone in Lebanon and you just dip your bread from one to the other, from one to the other, and some wondrous tastes there. No meal would be complete without dessert. Huh? And this is a famous baklava, pronounced batlewa, that is made in Lebanon. Now you can see on the left, it's filled here with this I think this is filled with pistachios here, huh? But it can also be filled with walnuts and it's dipped in honey. So it's just dripping with honey here at the bottom. Huh? Like in my story, that sweet honey, well, you can find it in batlewa. And on the right, there's also different kinds of batlewa. This one has pistachios in the middle. And this is, a, this is not really a batlewa, but another kind of dessert that's rolled in pistachios. And the one behind it is dipped in honey. And oh my goodness, it's sweet, but it's very, very good. This one here has cheese inside. That one also is good. Mm. 
I'm getting hungry. All right. So now I've told you about Lebanon. Let me tell you about when I went to the United States, because that was an important country as well. And as I said, it's in California. Look at that. Los Angeles skyline on the left and Hollywood sign on the right. Yes, it was in Hollywood. And uh, no, people are not all stars, <laughs> but the film industry is very important for Hollywood, of course. This is the coastline, and this was very close to where my parents settled. Um, the county is called Orange County, and because there were a lot of orange trees there, and walnut trees and other things, and sometimes they say that the most beautiful sunsets can be found on Southern California's coastline, like this one. Do you recognize the place? I'll bet you do. Disneyland. The first Disneyland opened up in Anaheim, California. And I lived in Anaheim, just a few miles down the road. Oh my goodness, everything was Disneyland. So when I was a teenager, this was the thing that we would do, was go in groups of teenagers and go to Disneyland. So here's the castle, it's kind of uh, replicates Snow White's castle. We talked about that earlier. Um, on the right, there's the Mickey Mouse Ferris wheel and here on the bottom is, was my favorite ride, which was It's a Small World. Now, why was It's a Small World my favorite ride? Because it talked about many different countries and their traditions. And I love to travel. Here's some of the typical food uh, from Southern California. Now you're going to say, well, hmm, it looks maybe Mexican. Well, guess what? We're so close to Mexico that the food is Mexican. Here we have tacos and taco chips, pizzas, and there's also fresh salads and the avocados grow in many different places in Southern California. So you have guacamole. So from Southern California, oh, sorry, to the right, emblematic orange from Orange County. Uh, the oranges are sweet in Southern California. So from there, let's travel again, okay? Get on a plane and go to the place where I moved to and where my heart lies as well. Although my heart also lies with my home country. Yes, Paris, France. Now, on the right, you have the Eiffel Tower. I know you had a French storyteller already, but he lives in the south of France. And um, I happen to live in Paris, so I get to see the Eiffel Tower when I go. It's on the other side of town. But when I go biking, because I bike around Paris, and guess what? There was one day where I was so happy to bike. It was what I call D-Day, which it was used during the Second World War, but it wasn't that kind of D-Day. It's Deconfinement Day, when we were allowed to go out of our homes. And this is me biking in front of the Eiffel Tower on deconfinement day. Woohoo! <laughs> I've got the, the bike mask on for pollution, but it's also useful in a pandemic. And my sunglasses and my hair was blowing in the wind. I was so happy that day that I got to bike in front of the Eiffel Tower. It was great. On the left, you see Notre Dame Cathedral. Now that's the center of Paris, and it is a cathedral from the Middle Ages. It was initially built in the 12th century, 13th century, it took quite a while to build. Unfortunately, last year, there was a fire that burned that steeple here. So you won't see that anymore, but they're rebuilding Notre Dame. It's a very famous place. And on the right is a view from the top of Notre Dame, Towards Paris, you can see the Eiffel Tower in the distance and the gargoyles. Now, the gargoyles were creatures that were supposed to protect the inside of Notre Dame from the bad things outside. So they were the guardians of Notre Dame. Here we have the Louvre, the glass pyramid of the Louvre at sunset. Actually, all the art and wonderful art 
is downstairs, when you go downstairs, and then you can go and see different things like the Mona Lisa. And on the right is my favorite bridge in Paris called the Bridge of Alexandre III. I, I like it because of its decorations. What would France be like without its wonderful bread? Oh my goodness, great bread in France. This is the baguette. And on your right, you see what I see when I go to a bakery. Different kinds of bread and croissant here at the bottom. And parmesan, bread with, with raisins or bread with chocolate. And here is an apple tart. So those are famous pastries. Uh, sorry, not pastries. They're called viennoiseries. Viennoiseries is uh, breads and bread um, um, make things, if you like, for breakfast. Here are the pastries. Yes, oh my goodness. This is what France is famous for as well. Here we have a meringue with raspberries. These on the right are macarons, not to be confused with President Macron. But it sounds very similar. Macaron, which has got a cream filling. And on the bottom is my mother's favorite dessert, which is called a millefeuille. Millefeuille means multiple layer. And uh, here we have multiple layers with strawberries. Really good. So I hope I haven't made you too hungry with my presentation. But I'm getting hungry. Mm. Come and visit. We'll have some pastries together. So, here we are again. Yeah, uh, there are children who already started talking that they are hungry now. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, I can imagine, you know, all the delicious food that you showed. Uh, so, we'll go right into the questions, but just before that, so Shatabdi, uh, one of our volunteers who is also moderating today, on YouTube. She's online. We we'll just have her join in. So thank you, Shatabdi, for Hello. all in a regular at most of the sessions. Uh, I think there was someone who asked a question of Shatabdi is also a volunteer. She is. So Shatabdi, just introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Shatabdi Tanayanak, and currently I'm pursuing my graduation in English honors. And I'm aiming for a good college for my post-graduation degree. Okay. And I Thank like Buffalo, so of course. Thank you so much, Shatapti. Great having you. Welcome. Yeah. Let's get back to the questions and answers now. So, yes, I think there was a question about are these random people or are they... So the volunteers come and they show their interest. They say that we would like to volunteer and uh, then we kind of engage them so anyone can reach out to us and say we would like to you know you're doing good work we would like to help you do more work better work so that's how the volunteers come okay i think there was a question let's see about uh, the time so i think teresa you can tell them what time is it now in paris Right now, it is 5.24 p.m., late afternoon. Yeah, so when we started the storytelling, I think Priyanka had asked that question and someone else also. Uh, it was 4.30 p.m., right? 9 p.m. in India was 4.30 p.m. in Paris. Right, right. Okay. Yes. Yes. So let's see what other questions are there. Uh there are so many. Okay, I've just gone up. Um, I, let's see. Uh, Priyanka has asked, have you been to India? Have you traveled to India? Yes, I have. And India had a great influence on my life and artistic work. I studied Katakali which is from, as you know, Southwest India, from Kerala. And I studied it first here in Paris. And then I went to Kerala to study uh, Katakali and was wonderful. I got to study and also look, see the performances all night. It's really, really wonderful. And 
uh, also performed some Katakali here in Paris. And I heard my guru telling me about the stories um, that influenced what was performed, you know. So I heard a lot about the Ramayana. And I love that story so much. Um, I was asked to be part of a bigger group working on the Ramayana. Uh, we w did some uh, puppetry, Wayang Kulik, and performed the Ramayana. And then that was the first story I told as a storyteller was Ramayana because I loved it so much. And I wow. did it with a musician friend. So yes, thank you. Thank you, India. Thank you for the wonderful stories. I also love the Mahabharata, by the way, as well. Really, both are such beautiful, beautiful works. And um, anyway, it's very important for, for me. And of course, as I said, you know, for those of you, can I just have me full screen? Uh, one of my favorite poets and the first book that my wife asked me to gift her. Okay, let's have her back. Khalil Gibran, yeah. uh, so, you know, when the library opens, you can come back and check out this book. Okay. Yes. I there's think there's another, a question. Uh, yeah. Sorry, there's another writer that you should see as well. Khalil Gibran, very important man, of course, and he very, very profound and philosophical. Another writer is Amin Malouf. Amin Malouf, oh, yeah. he's written yeah. many, many books. Translated into English, uh, maybe he even wrote them in English initially. I don't know, um, but some very, very good uh, novels. So you might have that in the library as well. Yeah, sure. I'll definitely check that out. And I don't think we have, but I think we would like to have. Uh, mm. On that line, Sahil is asking, "What is your? Who's your favorite author?" I see. What is your favorite food? Yeah, no, this because this was related. Uh, I just asked. Ah, ah, ah! Who is my favorite author? Oh my, my very favorite author. Hmm, I like. Uh, I mean, Malouf, since I said, suggested him, I like his works uh, very much. His his books. Um, let's see who else. There was another Lebanese writer, Jacqueline Masabke who wrote a beautiful work about Lebanon under the Ottoman Empire and the transition between the Ottoman Empire, the French um, ruling and, and the independence. So that's, that's a very good book about the cedars. It's called, uh, but I'm like, I don't know. So children, I must tell anyway, you uh, Like, you know, she talked about the French had colonized Lebanon, the way the British had been in India, and we have so much of British influence on you know the things that we do. The fact that we are all speaking English is because of that British influence and the colonial history. Similarly, you know Lebanon was colonized by the French, and before that, the way we had the Mughals in India before the British came. So similarly, they had the Ottoman Empire. You know, mm. so yeah. similar stories. Yeah. Of, yeah. Absolutely, so, absolutely. The French wasn't really a colonization. It helped with the transition from the Ottoman Empire to independence, but it, it gave Lebanon a lot of its um, a lot of its laws. So it was a little different than a colonization, but still, nonetheless, it's very similar. Absolutely, we have similar histories. Yeah. And you know, uh, children, if you see, very interesting, if you notice on the map, I would urge you to go back to the map. If you look at the location of Lebanon, you have Europe on one side and the rest of Asia on another side. So it is like the cultures are meeting there. So that makes it very rich, you know, when you have cultures meeting. Like most of us are in, are in Orissa. The interesting thing about Orissa is we are in between North and South of India. So the North and the South meet there. So wherever cultures meet, that place becomes culturally rich. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's see. Uh, what are the questions? So there is a question from uh, Shubhay who is asking about the most famous festival in Lebanon. Hmm, I see. Well, there's a yearly festival in a place called Baalbek. Baalbek are the Roman ruins um, that are quite majestic, actually. Um, and there is a 
it's music, theater, different kind of dancing festival that takes place in the Roman ruins themselves. I mean, amongst the Roman ruins and it's beautifully lit. And it's a very, very nice festival of, of light, of culture, of music, uh, really wonderful. So that's the famous one, Malbec. Ah, uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I can see this question. Does snail taste good or is it disgusting? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, thank you, Anoop. <laughs> um, well, it depends what sauce you put on it, you know, and if it's cooked, it's better cooked. <laughs> uh, the French put garlic and butter and uh, it's cooked in its shell and it's quite good. I like it, actually. Um, you just don't have to think of the snail-like thing, but it tastes quite good. And you dip your French bread in the sauce. Mm, very nice. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know that many people here, not everyone, also eat dry fish in India, which of course smells a mm. lot. It smells, mm. but then there are people who swear by it. Everything, <laughs> food personal. <laughs> so I think Priyanshi is asking about the meaning of tanjure tanjure. Thank you, Priyanshi. Very good question. Well, yes, tanjura tanjura. It means pot in Arabic. Actually, cooking pot, the tandur, is a big pot, round pot, in which you cook stew, you know. And so when the pot was rolling, she was saying, tandura, tandura. And imme, which I say afterwards, means mother. So tandura, tandura, imme, pot, pot, mother. <laughs> ah. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. Uh, so... So Priyanshi is asking, what is the difference between Lebanon and Paris? What, what do you see as a difference? Traffic? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's, there's traffic in both, but Lebanon's traffic is very noisy. When you're in, in Beirut, at least in Beirut, you know, you hear, uh, like, uh, uh, like India. Like <laughs> yes. Um, maybe worse? Maybe or depending where in India, you know, it's pretty noisy. It really is. Um, in Paris, people are not allowed to honk their horns. So you have a lot of cars, but not as much noise. Uh, let's see. Other than that, what's the difference? Uh, Lebanon, the distances are small, for example, between Beirut and the mountain. You can go up the mountain in an hour and a half if there's not too much traffic. <laughs> um, and so you can get out of the, you can go from the sea to the mountain very quickly, you know, and, and get out from uh, the city very, very quickly. Paris is more widespread and you go out to the countryside, of course, uh, but it's not, the mountains are not so close. So Lebanon's very compact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, I think, uh, uh, yeah, so Aline is asking uh, if the Eiffel Tower is more famous or the Notre Dame. Ah, well, both are, really. Uh, you probably know the Eiffel Tower more because it really is the symbol of Paris. Uh, Notre Dame uh, is well known as well. Uh, more famous. You know how Notre Dame became famous? It was because there was a book by Victor Hugo named the Hunchback of Notre Dame, or the official name was Not Notre Dame of Paris, Notre Dame de Paris. So that book not only made uh, Notre Dame famous, but it helped contribute to its uh, being rebuilt because when he wrote the book, the, the church was falling apart. And so the book became famous and the government said, we have to work on keeping this monument in good shape. So it improved uh, the way they rebuilt the monument. So Priyanka has been asking many times. This must be the fifth or sixth time she has asked about your good. experience in your travel. Thank you, Priyanka, for being interested. What do you feel if you travel somewhere else? Wow. Well, when I travel, it puts many things in perspective because I see where I've come from very different and and because I'm elsewhere, 
You see, it's like sort of changing a, a prism and I appreciate where I've come from and I appreciate the new place. So it sort of uh, makes me look at things differently and enjoy also the similarities because we are all human. And when I see love in different countries, I think, well, love is a very human feeling and, and having a good meal together is a very human feeling and finding that we are all very similar on this earth, uh, you know, is, a, is very good. It helps keep peace, doesn't it? We should all travel so that people realize that we are all the same. So Eva is asking on the same lines, which is your favorite place, given the fact that you travel so much? Mm, do I have one favorite place? There are things I like about many places. And of course, no place is perfect. There's no paradise on earth. Uh, paradise is inside. Um, my favorite, I have favorite places in each country. And the pictures showed me, showed you some of the, my favorite places because I chose them. So uh, the, the pictures basically told you what, what my favorite places are. But those cedar trees are very special to me, let me say. When I go to the top of Lebanon and I'm near the top, the Mount Lebanon, and I know those cedar trees, I feel as big as a cedar. Ah, the, that, that reminds me of the significance of the cedar trees in the epic of Gilgamesh, which I told you I, I also yeah. loved. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, yes, children, if, when you get a little older, if you can read the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the first story ever written, it was written on clay tablets and it dates from about 2500 to 3000 BC. Um, and it, it has been translated, of course, and put on paper. But if you can read that story, it's such an important story. And they go to the cedar forest in that story. And uh, well, they it's a long story, so you have to you have to read it to find yeah. out what happens in the cedar forest. If you come to the library, we have it. I don't have it right now in this room, but it's in another room. We have multiple oh. copies, multiple editions of Gilgamesh. Uh, Pratima, oh, no. you've been asking your question many times, but I'm not sure what you really mean. But maybe the province that you belong to, the main state of your city. She's asking. It, where I'm at now, I'm in Paris, yeah, France. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the main state we, in, in France, it's not really states, but departments. And the, 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 what they call département, I don't know if it's department, but anyway, counties. And the county around Paris is called Ile de France. Ile de France means the island of France because it's the center of France. And uh, so it's called Ile de France. Okay, so there is a question from uh, Sarah, who's asking the most famous story in Lebanon. Hmm. Well, there are several. Um, wow, there are several. Anjar, which is the story of a um, famous man in uh, in Lebanon, um, and. A Thousand and One Arabian Nights, you know, I mean, it's more from another part of the Middle East, but it's also told in Lebanon. Um, what other, Sarah? There's, well, there's so many, there's lots of oral tradition in Lebanon. There's a, a lot of uh, storytelling and it's done in cafes uh, where men gather. So the men hear stories in the cafes and the women tell stories at home to their families. So there's a distinction, but there's a lot of storytelling going on. Ah, uh, okay. So there are a lot of questions still coming in. We, we have crossed one hour, 10 minutes now. I won't be able to take all the questions. Uh, so if I have already asked some of your questions, I may not ask your question again. Uh, so please don't mind. Please understand that, you know, uh, it's already late. Uh, let's see. Sujata has a question. Do you know Orissa? Uh, no, I, I've never been, unfortunately. I hope to one day. But I do know about the dance of the of the Tribandi, yes? 
the Arisi dance, where there's Trivandi, the three thing. I know about that because I studied Katakali and I know that the different dances. I didn't practice it, I'm sorry, but I know of it. And I know Arisa is supposed to be a very nice state. So you're very lucky uh, to be there. Time, next time you have to come to Arisa. So for yeah, those who pleasure. don't know, the Papul Library where I'm sitting, that's in Bhumaneshwar in Orissa. Okay. Uh, Ravi is asking, which is the most famous followed religion in Lebanon? Oh, interesting. Because Lebanon is a country where there are several religions that live side by side and together. Um, there is a Mount Lebanon initially was a Christian enclave, so it was the mountain, okay? Um, but uh, also there were Druze, which is a Muslim sect um, that were living side by side. And then when you go down from Mount Lebanon, you're going down to the plains and there this mixture of Muslim, of Christian. Um, at some point, I think there, there was a Jewish religion there, but no longer because Israel's next door and the Jewish religion is in Israel. Um, so Muslim and Christians live side by side, you know. Um, maybe there are some Hindi, uh, Hindus, so sorry, living there. I don't know. Uh, perhaps. Um, and maybe people from other, you know, walks of life, maybe some Buddhists as well. But anyway, there are several religions that live side by side. And there are mosques and churches that are side by side, even in the same village. So that's really good. Yeah, it's it's actually multi-religious, pretty much like India, but it's very interesting. You know, I was doing a little research uh, before this session, and you know what? Like in India, of course, anyone can be from any religion can be the prime minister or whatever. In Lebanon, apparently, they have a rule that says that the president has to be Christian, the prime minister has to be a Sunni Muslim, and the speaker of the parliament has to be a Shia Muslim. So that's an interesting way in which they have tried to ensure that the different religions or people following different religions are find representation in the highest powers of the country. So very interesting and many other things. I'll tell you, um, uh, Theresa, something that I found very interesting. In India, we often fight over mango trees because the mango tree may be planted in my neighbor's house, but the fruits may fall in my house, in my <laughs> inside my property. So the mangoes belong to whom? Where it is planted or whether where it falls? And in Lebanon, mm -hmm. I'm told there are two owners. One is the owner of the land and the other is the owner of the tree or the crop <laughs> there. So yeah. interesting yeah. things there. Yes. And, and, and if you want if you want the land to yourself, you have to pay double. You have to pay the landowner and you have to pay the tree owner. <laughs> so it becomes costly. Yeah. Thank you so much, Teresa. It was wonderful having you. And uh, for those of you who have been waiting so long to know the country that we'll travel to next Saturday, many of you guessed it right. The country of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the country of Rapunzel, for many of our very popular fairy tales, is the country where Teresa was born. And you yes. guessed it right, Germany. So we are traveling mm -hmm. to Germany next Saturday, same at 9 p.m., live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. But before that, of course, tomorrow is Rabi Bar Gopabar, in which we'll listen to stories in Oriya. Okay? So those of you who follow Oriya, again at 9 p.m. tomorrow, live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And once again, do not forget to share this video if you liked it. So many of them actually said, you know, there were questions about how did you learn these stories? How did you learn these songs? So maybe some last comments from you, Teresa, before we end. Well, to learn a story, you have to love it. So if you love a story and you love what's being said, that and it goes in your head and it goes in your heart. And then you can use any words you want to tell the story. And that's how you share story and song. So please let the, let the stories um, reach your head and your heart. And share them. And you must tell stories to others. The stories that you heard from Teresa, like 
her friend, Indian friend told her the story and that's how she's telling us now. So if you've heard a story, you liked it, you have to pass it on. You have to tell others. If you want to go back to this video, it is there on YouTube, it is there on Facebook videos. So you can go back, listen to the stories once again, rehearse and go and tell your friends or your grandmother or anyone else. Mm. So thank you very much everyone for staying till the very end and good night. And good night to you, Teresa. Thank you once again. Thank you. Take care. Bye.